right, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Thursday morning, June 4th, and this is a meeting of the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee of the House of Representatives in Vermont. And we have with us today our full committee, as well as um, several witnesses that are here from different agencies across the state of Vermont to talk to us about uh, we've been talking about housing the homeless uh, in, in response to the COVID crisis and trying to develop a plan based on the, the uh, coronavirus relief funds to um, not only get the homeless folks out of the motels that they're in, but into stable living situations and working with rules from the Treasury that are um, wide open to different interpretations, but um, we're working with JFO and, and Legislative Council with that. But I invited uh, Tony Grout from Capstone uh, here today, as well as Mary Bolton from the Washington County Mental Health and Angus and Angus, I'm sorry, I'm not sure, I, I don't wanna butcher the administer the the um, the organization that you're working with. So I'll let you or, um, introduce that when, when you come on, but, um, but I wanted to start with Tony Grout because Tony works for Capstone and uh, does the coordinated entry. We've heard the phrase coordinated entry when it comes to dealing with the homeless population that have been put into the motel so far. And the promise of the coordinated entry is that we will have a better set of data on who these folks are, what their needs are, and how best we can help them. And I just really wanted to have Tony come in and explain that to us in um, her experiences, what it, me what it actually means and her experiences with that in um, for the last three months. So Tony, I'll pass the microphone right to you and, and get underway. Thank you for showing up today. Thank you. So I am Tony Grout. I work for Capstone Community Action as uh, stated. We are one of five community action agencies in Vermont. Um, each community action agency provides uh, some form of housing services. Some run shelters, some do not. Um, but we all interface with the coordinated entry system around the state. So coordinated entry, that's the big question right now. Um, coordinated entry is a system that is um, designed so that people get fair and equal access to housing. What that means is that someone in the housing world and in, in the capstone uh, community action, well, all of the housing providers in the state provide housing assessments. And um, that identifies people's needs. So coordinated entry identifies if people have a short, medium, or long-term service need. That means that if they're short-term, they don't need a lot of support, maybe under six months just to get back on their feet. If they have a medium-term service need, that means that they need somebody to really help them work on some basic skills or they need a short-term, uh, medium-term subsidy. So something up to two years. Long-term folks are people who um, need long-term vouchers. They need long-term services. So somebody who helps them navigate day-to-day -day, um, neighbor conflicts. They might have um, serious mental health needs, substance abuse needs. Um, and there's also a portion of them that just can't afford rent long-term. So if they're on SSI, the average SSI payment is about 805 in the state of Vermont. Fair market rents in Washington County are 850 for a one bedroom. So there's just no possible way for them to afford housing without a subsidy or without being in um, a subsidized unit with a housing authority. So those make up our long-term folks. Um, that's the basics of the category. So coordinated entry also identifies housing barriers. So different reasons that people might struggle to um, get into housing or maintain housing. By identifying those barriers, we're able to match individuals with the best services to make sure that they remain housed once we get them housed. Um, successfully housing people and is more than bricks and mortar. It's not just about an affordable place to live. It really does come back to the services and the collaborations in the community to make sure that every household is supported based on their needs. 
um, in the plan that Washington County has put together, we actually suggest that perhaps a COSA model for housing um, is a fantastic long-term suggestion as we know that services, there will never be enough services for everyone who needs them. And COSA, and COSA is? Oh, uh, Circles of Support and Accountability. It's a volunteer program that is used for people who are leaving um, incarceration and re-entering the community. So uh, Rick DeAngelis from the Good Samaritan Haven had brought forward this idea of, you know, what if we tried to get together a COSA model, so a volunteer model of people who are interested in providing housing support to households who might need a little bit of help. That obviously wouldn't work for those folks who have serious mental health issues, um, which you know we have identified and we know is a need, not only in Washington County, but throughout the state. Um, but for all of those people who fall into that medium term category, who may not have life skills, um, who may not have those basic conflict resolution skills, um, the COSA model might be a really great plan. Um, and something a bit more sustainable than simply saying, will you give us, um, you know, 10 new case managers per count? That's not really um, a sustainable plan. So any questions about that before I move on with some numbers? Well, yeah, we do have a couple of questions and I'll just start. So do you find that this, this coordinated entry is, a, I won't say it's relatively new, but do you find it to be, effective in determining, you know, at least in Washington County, I mean, the document that was provided last week showed that there's 230 plus households um, and, and, and there's proposed solutions uh, for those numbers of people. Do you find that, that the way that you manage the coordinated entry is an, is, is an effective way of identifying um, the needs of this population in real time? Yeah, so um, I will say that, you know, we, Capstone runs uh, coordinated entry both in Washington County and Lamoille County, and they support um, in Orange County. So they're not the lead agency in Orange, but they um, are active in their local groups. And across all of the counties, we have found that it is a good way to identify individuals and what they need. Um, the silver lining to the coronavirus has been that getting everyone into motels, um, we've really identified all of the housing insecure folks in Washington County and in Lamoille, people who traditionally have kind of fallen through the cracks. And we have been able to identify not only what kind of services they need, we know what size bedroom apartments they need, we know what kind of income they have. Um, the data we have is the best that we've had in the last five years that I've been running the uh, housing program and coordinated entry in Washington County. Great. I have a question from Representative Walls, then Triano. Thank you, Rob. You mentioned identifying barriers and I'm curious, uh, what are the most significant barriers yeah, so often uh, it really depends on which uh, group you're talking about. So our long-term folks, um, the most common barriers to housing are length of homelessness. So it's really hard to get an apartment um, if you haven't been housed for the last, you know, three, four years. You don't have those rental references. Um, other barriers involve um, mental health, drug addiction, um, trying to think of the biggest ones we see. Those are really, for long term, the, the biggest, and income. Uh, you know, we have seniors who, unfortunately, maybe they lose a spouse and they only have um, their Social Security income. We see them become homeless. And then once they hit that long term category, they're not eligible for some of the vouchers that are designed for medium term folks, unless they have like this sustainability plan, which involves filling out lengthy applications and waiting on uh, subsidized housing wait lists that are 
you know, one to three years long for a unit. And that's not even Section 8 vouchers. That's just managed properties. Mm -hmm. But for our medium term folks, we see a lot of evictions. Uh, a lot of people who, once they get into an apartment, um, they, they don't necessarily have those skills to manage them. Um, or they just fall in that uh, category of they have income, they're working, um, but not enough to afford the rents. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Trina. Yes, uh, thanks for being here today. Um, these categories that you bring to us are, are actually not a surprise. I mean, I, we can over the course of the years, we have surmised that these are the folks that, uh, these are the divisions of what we see is in, in the homeless population. I guess, but my question is uh, in COSA now, I'm familiar with COSA. Um, I've worked with some of the volunteers here in Hardwick uh, uh, in my district, and um, I know a number of them. And um, I had a 35 year uh, career in, in the public defender's office, so familiar with corrections as well. So. How would how would this COSA model be modified to accommodate families, or do you not anticipate? Do you anticipate these are just individual people? Um, I actually anticipate that it could be used for families uh, or individual people. Um, okay. You know, we at Capstone, um, for those of you who may not know, we run um, several different areas for housing. We uh, take care of prevention, so folks who are um, currently housed, but maybe facing eviction. We um, run a rapid rehousing section where we help people who are literally homeless get into housing. We also have emergency scattered site units that operate in lieu of a family shelter in Washington County. All of those programs, except for the emergency scattered site units are also operated in Lamoille and Orange. So we see a lot of folks who honestly, just are missing some of those skills. They don't know how to mediate. Some of them um, were not ever really taught about how to keep their apartment. So we work with a lot of people on, you have to take the trash out every second day, even if it's not full. You know, you have to do the dishes, even if you don't need clean dishes. Um, and those are like basic life skills that people forget. Um, not everyone has grown up with those expectations. Um, so I, I, that's where I see the COSA model coming in. It's for the individuals who need those kind of skills or support, not for the people who need, um, permanent supportive housing or mental health supports. The Family Center of Washington County does a fantastic job with their, um, family supportive housing. So those are folks who need even more intensive services. Those services would be extended to the children as well. I mean, at this point, we have to um, uh, assure that education needs are being met at this point, for especially for folks that are going in or, or result of um, medium, let's say medium uh, homelessness uh, category that have been out for a while and have one or two children that um, it's questionable as to whether or not they're receiving their education or not. That's a real issue for me. Yeah, I think that that's a concern for all of us. Um, you know, a concern not just for the kids, but for the parents who are trying to make sure that their kids are getting access to education. Um, you know, we know a lot of families that the access to the education and completing the schoolwork is extremely important, but they've been put into a situation that, that they're not actually equipped to handle. Yeah. 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 And with scattered internet, that makes it even more complicated that they can't rely on um, uh, visual, virtual learning through their teachers uh, at this point. So that exacerbates right. the situation. Well, and we know that a, a large number of families don't have um, laptops. They don't have cell phones. Uh, we run into that doing the assessments to even get folks onto the coordinated entry list yep. is that a lot of individuals don't have cell phones and um, even some of the motels in Washington County, they don't have phones in the room. So just to get in touch with people, we have to try to catch the front desk person who may or may not be there. And then he's got to walk the phone, the office phone over to um, the person's room. And then the assessment takes 40 minutes. So we tie up somebody's phone line. Um, so 
so there's all kinds of uh, technology challenges for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you. Representative Kalaki. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm, I am not familiar with the COSA model. So I'm curious, I, I, what, how large of a network of volunteers are you working with to kind of help, help provide these services? Yeah, so I should be clear that this is not something that is currently happening. This okay. is part of the Washington County plan to okay. address um, the future needs of our area. Um, you know, one of the issues that has been highlighted through the coordinated entry process, because that's what we're really talking about is, yeah. does it work, um, is that 64% of the households we have provided assessments to are long-term households. So people who need those services and uh, voucher support for more than two years. Um, yeah, it's a big number, 64% uh, of them. And um, and interestingly enough, that it's also 64% of the people on the list that have uh, SSI. So um, a big number of folks who are on this fixed income with really not a lot of options of getting it, um, increasing their income enough to afford apartments. So um, the coordinated entry process, that's telling us it's painting a really clear picture of how many households need those long-term services, how many of them need long-term vouchers. Um, and I will say the Vermont State Housing Authority, we work really closely with them. They're fantastic about trying to get vouchers out, prioritizing people for managed properties, um, but there are limitations. So many of the vouchers are designed for people who are in that medium term category, people who have some kind of um, prospect for moving off of these temporary vouchers in two years. And now what we know is that 64% of people, unless they can get into a managed property, will not move on within two years. And the other piece, um, I, I should say that collaboration is huge. And one of the things that has come from um, the coronavirus and trying to understand who's homeless and how do we move them on, it has really strengthened our relationships with everyone in the community. I mean, it's truly an all hands on deck um, feeling for us housing providers, Washington County Mental Health, Downstreet, the housing authorities, um, the Family Center, Pathways, Another Way, like these are all folks who are working to create plans and to understand the full scope of things. And um, through that, we have, we've been able to say only, it's like a quarter of the people have submitted housing applications. And that's why I brought that up as a, as a real challenge um, because those applications haven't got bigger. So I think what I had heard is that, you know, after uh, the recession, the SNAP application got even longer. Um, these are the standard applications. So we're asking people to fill out 122 pages of housing applications to be put on wait lists that are one to three years long. That's like asking somebody who's dieting to eat crackers to lose 10 pounds in two years. Um, it's just, it feels hopeless to them and they can't get it done. And that's why I bring up that universal application that has already been designed that Downstreet is using that's 15 pages. So if we want people to move into these managed properties so that we don't have to try to find more vouchers, we have to make it attainable for them. We can't Thank ask you. people who are living on the street to, to fill out the same information. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. So Tony, that I think that that's a lead into you you said that was a lead into this kind of what the services are that these that all of you provide, um, which is sitting next to somebody for hours filling out these applications. But I think you had some numbers that you wanted to share from Washington County. Yeah, I just um, you know, the long term piece was a big 
part of it, that there are 64% of the folks are long-term. 29% um, of the households are medium-term, which means they don't have a, a lot of um, huge housing, negative housing history, um, but they can't afford an apartment. Um, and, and that being said, you know, that brings up another part that we have kind of talked about, which is to allow folks to roommate, to have single room occupancies. Those are all things that historically have been um, kind of shunned and we've, we've put our values of people's own space. But what we've learned through uh, the coronavirus is that that kind of isolation is really bad for people. Um, you know, some people, yeah, roommates aren't perfect for everyone, but for a lot of people, being completely isolated, um, being in a place of your own when you don't have a natural support system um, actually isn't great for their mental health. It isn't great for sobriety. Um, so really identifying how do we how do we formalize that? You know, how do we take uh, like home share that matches people? How do we do that in an apartment kind of model, right? We know that housing's not affordable. So if we can start to split those costs a little bit more, um, that might help things along. Um, and one of the reasons that came up is that when we looked at the list, there were 92 households that are homeless that have income. So these are not all people with no income and no prospect to pay anything for rent. These are folks, some of them are working. We have uh, at least a dozen that have income of $2,000 or more a month that are still homeless living in the shelter or on the street. Well, right now, thankfully in the motel. Um, but there are people who can't uh, move along into permanent housing. And so um, I want to give you, so, so where can you, do you have more for us? Uh, I don't want to like, I, I don't want to say, oh, let's go to Mary now, because this is all tied in together. And, right. um, and so I, Representative Triano raised his hand here with a question for you, Tony, hold on a second. Sure. So um, we, we know that a, a number of these medium, especially the folks that you were just speaking of the, that actually have an income, um, I guess that more often than not, um, what we're experiencing or what they're experiencing actually is that when they maybe have come on hard times and become evicted, that first last and security is an insurmountable amount of money for them to come up to uh, come up with, even though they have income that can pay a rent. So we have heard um, that first and last, uh, maybe through uh, legal aids, uh, hot program uh, would be a solution to some of that. Is that would that be accurate to say? Sometimes. Um, and we, you know, at Capstone, um, we do provide security deposits. We can provide first month's rent. Um, we work with folks on that all the time. If they fall behind and they need some support with back rent, we help with that as well. Um, in addition, we provide that housing counseling piece that's necessary um, to help people. We, we've got um, some fantastic financial counselors at Capstone that work on budgets with people. Um, and we try to get them connected to any other services in the community um, that they might need to be successful. Um, so sometimes it's about back rent. Oftentimes, I think landlords will work with us with back rent if there's a plan. Um, more often, it's, it's that there's another reason. Um, so Again, it might come back to those services. They might be behind in rent, but they also maybe might not be the best neighbor or they, um, they might not keep their place as tidy as they need to, be, need to have it. Um, so oftentimes there are other reasons, but certainly first class and security is a barrier. Um, I talked with the Berry City Council about that when they were looking to um, 
and successfully uh, allowed for SLAC and security now. Um, and, you know, really just said, like, if you have a two parent household that both of them work full time at minimum wage, um, they still can't afford it. You're, you're talking about, you know, yeah. $3,600 to move into a two bedroom apartment in Barrie. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I definitely think that's a challenge. Um, I think before we move on, the, the last couple things I'd like to touch on um, would be that through the coordinated entry process and the collaboration of all of our community partners, we've completed 170 assessments. So we have talked to 170 households and, and asked them, you know, all of the questions, all of the assessment questions, and 82% uh, of those households require studios or one bedrooms. Um, it's a huge number. And we also know that those happen to be the hardest units to, um, to get into and the hardest units to afford if you're a single person. Um, and in our, our plan, our Washington County plan, which I can um, share with you guys, you know, we do talk about the need for um, more permanent supportive housing. We talk about um, a direct response or a step down from uh, the motel system is important as we move forward, um, making sure that we keep folks who are medically vulnerable and families housed through this. Um, and po the possibility of expanding the Vermont rental subsidy program to include temporary vouchers for that population so that we can move them out of expensive hotels and into apartments and connect them with those um, case management services. And I think that it's possible. I mean, what we saw after the COVID-19 uh, when it first started, we formed a regional response team and in Washington County, our numbers were huge. We had 2,403 volunteer hours in Washington County in 52 days. So there are people in Washington County who are willing to step up, to provide that support. Um, you know, we kind of, we pulled together between interfaith groups, uh, restaurants and capstone and we provided 18,199 meals so big numbers um i think with some creativity the communities are ready at least i know lamoille county is um, they have a history of partnering with other people and actually were advisors and helped set up the lamoille community house which was I think Lamoille County's first homeless shelter. That's pretty big news. Um, and the collaboration is here now. The community partners are all engaged. We're all working together every single day. Um, so if there's ever been a time for um, creativity and really making something happen, it's now. Any other questions? One last one for Tony, Chip. Yes. Um, so all this, these great things that are in place right now, as you just described and, and presented to us, my question is, how do we get the number of homeless people, Vermonters, that exist now through your system? What does it take? How much money? Um, how much personnel, well, what will it take to really take Washington County, and I think you said part of Orange County, that, and take these homeless Vermonters and get them placed and get this done? What, what, what will it take? Well, I think that's a huge question. And if I had the answer, um, I probably wouldn't be on this call. I'd be doing something different, right? None of us would be on this call. Um, I do think that there are some amazing um, 
strategies, if we were forward thinking and had the resources, I think that um, seeing the number of folks on SSI, if as a state we said, no one who is disabled is going to be homeless, and we said, you're a single individual on SSI, here is your managed property or here is your section eight voucher. Um, I think we would see a lot less people in the shelters. Um, I think a lot of people end up in the shelters and in this chronic homelessness because they can't afford an apartment because they are on SSI and they don't have a, a second income in the household. Um, as far as Washington County, it's connecting people it's connecting people to resources. It's having smaller, um, more affordable units. We've been talking a lot with Downstreet about the possibility of micro apartments, of um, implementing those single room occupancies in a thoughtful, beautiful way that says, we care about you, and this is gonna be the space that you can afford. Um, the, the real issue is that if you only get a, 805 for income, you've got to be able to afford a smaller space. Um, so how do we do that in a thoughtful way? There are models in Boston that are successful. Uh, Caritas Communities is in Boston and they are, um, they have been doing this model of single room occupancies of micro apartments and making affordable living spaces in a typically unaffordable city. So um, it's bricks and mortars changing what's actually available. It's how do people access services? So again, in the Washington County plan, we have a uh, proposal for a hub, which would have the shelter on the bottom. It would have um, room for services so that case management can be handled right there. Um, on the second floor, it would have micro apartments and permanent supportive housing for folks. It would have a uh, people's health and wellness clinic because that's really the problem. It's taking folks who are not connected, who feel hopeless, who uh, don't know how to navigate this confusing world of homelessness and housing and connecting them with all of the people that they need to be successful. And then hopefully moving on. So it's services. We can't, we can't just build it and say, it's gonna be great. Um, if it was, all of the private landlords would rent to every homeless person. But what we hear is they don't want to do that because they come with challenges and um, sometimes significant risks. So we know that services have to be there. We know that collaboration with all of our community partners has to be there. No, there's not a single organization that can say, yep, we can take it and we can end homelessness. It's, it's a community um, response, it really is. So I know that was a little long-winded and uh, maybe not exactly answering your question, but. Um, That's okay. I mean, yeah. I, I think it was, a, I think that was a simple yes or no question from Chip, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Tony. Please hang out because we'll have a conversation after we hear from Angus and Mary. Um, but thank you for the information. Thank you for sharing the, the Washington County plan that gives at least, you know, and, and, and to know and for the clarification that it's actually Washington County, Lamoille County, and a little bit of a sort of Orange County. Um, right. So Orange County, we're just not the lead agency, but our yeah. Orange County office is very connected with um, the lead agency there. and. Um, super active in the continuum of care. So those of you who don't know, you're always welcome to the continuum of care. Every county has one. I'm the co-chair in Washington County, and that's where um, close to 20 different organizations come together monthly to talk about the um, situation in each county. And to we're basically charged with creating our plan for the community. Um, and every county's got one. So you can be involved in yours. I'm sure that people would love to see you guys there. So. Thank you, Tony. Welcome. Um, Mary Moulton, welcome back. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I, I'd ask you um, to come on to really um, give us some nuts and bolts here. Um, it sounds like, you know, Tony covered a lot of the administrative Good. issues that have that, that 
we're facing that 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 everyone faces all the time but that now as we're moving forward to really put a put a bit of a spotlight on it to get an understanding and and i just um i just wanted you to come on to share from your agency's perspective the difficulties of people with um, moderate to severe mental health issues who are trying to find a place and what kind of services have to be provided. I think we've heard we heard a little bit from Tony about why it's hard to get people into private landlord apartments. Um, there's many risks. Um, there's many um, services that are needed. Uh, most landlords, most private landlords aren't in the business of social services. Um, so I was just wondering if you could just give us a rundown of what an individual household might face or might need uh, moving forward um, in tandem, I guess, with this administrative, you know, these 15 to 40 page applications of um, for housing applications or for um, um, food stamps or for SNAP benefits or what have right. you. Right, so thank you. So for the record, Mary Moulton, uh, Executive Director at Washington County Mental Health Services. And I, I just wanna start by saying I, I wasn't always an administrative person. Um, for those that don't know me, I worked as an emergency services clinician in the field for most of my career. And so uh, really did work out uh, doing direct service and learn most of what I know from those that we serve. Um, Tony, uh, really spoke really clearly to the problem. It's ominous. And um, these numbers around long term are uh, more in line with what Washington County Mental Health Services um, provides, provides uh, on a high end for a certain population. But we also work across different, si different systems and with different providers on an outpatient basis for people falling between the cracks. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the buckets um, so that you can kind of understand the buckets and some of the, some of the, um, some of the shared challenges that we're all having. I also want you to know we're so dedicated to this process that we meet every Saturday morning. Uh, as a group. And so we are really working to try to figure out how to crack this nut. And um, one of our greatest, two of our greatest challenges, of course, are affordable housing and vouchers. So uh, beyond that, supports we know are essential. And we do have um, supports provided. Those forms that Tony was talking about are, are filled out by capstone uh, case managers as well. And um, also uh, by the Family Center, by Washington County. Um, and um, we have uh, people receiving ca those case management supports for housing uh, through things, through organizations like SASH, supports and services at home as well. So um, the first group I wanna talk about, are, are, it, it's the mental health budget really. And it doesn't concern the, the money that you're talking about, but just so you have a sense, we have people with high needs um, in our community support programs, and they, we receive a bundled payment for that. And their case management includes housing supports. Um, that we have a housing one housing support specialist for 347 people. And uh, that just to give you an idea of how hard that person has to work around with case managers, not doing it alone, but with case managers and with the entire community along with landlords. Um, but we also provide employment supports, psychiatry, transportation and community supports for people. So these are folks that have serious mental illness, long-term needs, that third category that Tony mentioned. And you know we have right now in that group of 347, we have 13 people who, 13 to 15 who are homeless. I'll tell you about those in a little bit or, or a couple of them. But um, the, we, two years, three years ago, we only, we, we actually had eradicated hotel use for that population completely. That isn't the case today. And I think that speaks really to the housing market and how difficult it is to get into with people who present some real challenges along the lines of having been evicted, perhaps having done some property destruction, um, not paying their rent, even with the supports we give sometimes this small group. And it, it's, as we figure it, about three to 4% has a real struggle. So the, 
you know, the cost of a person, that re average cost of a person we serve in that program, um, even though we have outliers and we have wraparounds, is about twenty-four to to twenty-eight thousand dollars a year. And 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 we're really working to keep people out of hospitalization and higher needs of care, and helping them live in their communities. So. You know, hospitalization these days, psychiatric hospitalization for years, about $800,000. So, you know, it's a deal when we think about this comparatively. That's, um, per, per, that's per person? That's right. That's right. If you go to the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, it's $750,000 to $800,000 a year. Um, and so, um, you know, we're, we're, of course, we have a broader package, but um, that's, that's, you know, that's an average cost. And I do want to mention those um, with developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities, because that's a group of people who, before COVID, we were really talking about wanting to increase their ability to have vouchers for housing vouchers. A lot of those folks live with home providers. And so they don't access housing vouchers, um, but they're becoming more independent. They're becoming more integrated in the community. And so, you know, I was thinking about that the other day, just wanted to share. That's another group who really don't access housing vouchers, but had uh, within their own advocacy groups are working for that. Um, the next bucket that, that I talk about are the outpatient and, and what I call an, an intensive clinical case management. Um, and, and maybe mini wrap, Capstone does it, we do it, Family Center does it. Um, but these folks are outpatient service folks and Washington County wasn't involved with housing for those folks um, several years ago. We did therapy in outpatient, um, but people's needs are so great. And we now have more of an adult division rather than just a community support program position, division and an outpatient division because people uh, may not meet the criteria for that higher wrap I just talked about, but their needs are very great. They've lost their employment perhaps, um, you know, having real struggles with uh, perhaps some uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety. In the hotels right now, we have a lot of people we're serving through outpatient services, and we actually are seeing higher levels, of course, of depression and anxiety. Um, and we have one, uh, now two case managers who work with folks uh, in the hotels and one connected closely to the shelter. So um, what, what we had put into the um, proposal that uh, Tony was talking about is some service provision and one clinician um, through Washington County Mental Health to, to increase our ability to help those folks. The numbers are ominous and it's not going to appear in the mental health budget. Um, so we, we were, want to work across systems. Um, we want to reconnect all the time with housing entities, and landlords and shelters and churches. And if we had a position, we would be doing that as long as, as well as doing some outreach to probably encampments. So um, that's an outreach position that um, we are seeking. So um, Mary, 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 yeah. just a quick question though. When, when one of your providers goes to the Econo Lodge in particular and says, and, and is making the rounds, if you will, what is it exactly there? How are they interfacing with, with the, the households there? So um, we, so the Econo Lodge is currently the shelter. Um, shelter moved there and there are some people at the hilltop. So the person that goes there currently um, is available to people who want to um, receive some services, receive some supports. Um, the, there, there are case managers helping with housing there. So we create a bridge to services, perhaps to psychiatry. Um, we, uh, we had uh, someone recently, you know, if we find someone in crisis, we get them into what we call urgent care. And we created an urgent care division several years ago. So that position actually will assist people who we determine with them need some mental health supports, some substance use supports perhaps, and we'll knit the services together so that they can give them transportation to where they need to go. Um, and our clinician, even through COVID, um, was on site um, at the Econo Lodge and um, just uh, placed himself 
uh, in a common area and there was a lot of space so social distancing could be had and people accessed him uh, through that. We also um, had three people die during this period of time at the hotels. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that. Not, uh, I believe, COVID related, but we found a number of people and Tony could tell us the percentage that are over 60 years old who are homeless. And so um, anyway, we had three deaths and we were able to do a grief group um, with folks there with Rick DeAngelis and we, we work very closely with the shelter uh, through that clinic. So um, that's, that's what we currently do, um, supports and bridging and services. Um, and then um, that continues, we, do we are connected with some vouchers. If you get a voucher, you also have services within the voucher. Um, and those could be, uh, you know, a low touch, not in, you know, an easier touch to a more extensive touch. So we follow through with that out uh, patient case manager um, to people when they're housed to help them to maintain that housing um, along with all of our partners. Um, the, I, I mentioned the um, family supportive housing model and that's uh, through family center. Tony mentioned that as well. Um, and I know Representative Triana, you asked about what services that they uh, are providing. So I reached out to them and um, uh, just to ask what they're doing currently. So it's a weekly meeting with families. They provide life skill management, include budgeting, um, savings account matching with Northfield Savings Bank. They do parenting support. And we've got a number of people, a number of families and hotels. So. Um, they're reaching out, they attend DCF meetings, they do safety planning, um, nutrition support, and um, they are supporting parents in accessing substance use services and food diapers right now, big diaper drives, phone card minutes, um, and help with back bills, auto repairs so that there's transportation. These are all things that this village of case managers are doing together. and. Um, that's the family center. Um, the, the, the highest need group I want to point out are the wraparounds. And wraparounds um, are those, in our definition at Washington County, mental health of wraparounds are 24 seven supports. And there's a price range. Um, so these people say at the hotel, if we find, you know, they, they are needing psychiatric hospitalization, um, they are they have, are evicted from their housing. Um, if we have a space where we can do 24 seven supports for them when they come out so that they can get back on their feet and transition back either independent housing or as Tony said, a shared housing arrangement, whatever will work for them, um, that's what we want to support. So um, wraparounds come um, with uh, that, that support from psychiatry, um, from 24 seven staff, these people perhaps have had histories of psychosis, violent behaviors, property destruction. Um, and so um, we might be spending as a state $125,000 uh, to $250,000 a year on people uh, if they need a one-on-one -on -one in order to get back on their feet. But again, think of that annual psychiatric hospitalization cost, and we're still um, under that cost. And that also comes from the mental health budget. Um, we have, as I mentioned, these 13 people. And just to give you an example of folks that um, we might find in any of these settings, we, we had one person who was recently at the hotel. She was discharged from Rutland Hospital. Um, she really needed level two care, a nursing home care but they needed to move her from the hospital. I don't think if we didn't have COVID in, she wouldn't have been moved, she would have stayed there, but it's kind of like a push um, to have people uh, moving through the system. Within three days, she had fallen four times. She was not able to navigate within the hotel. Um, she screamed for four to five hours before someone finally called for an ambulance. She is now on her 24th day being in the emergency room and she is in line for a nursing home bed. So that's someone who went to a hotel. Um, and uh, again, we have this, this element of elders. She is one of those. 
Um, I will tell you that it'll take a year for us to find a bed for her in a nursing home in Vermont. And uh, maybe we won't find one here. We'll probably have to send her to New Hampshire. So uh, she's really moved out of the emergency room today and she's gonna be going into a hospital bed. Um, we have uh, two, three, four, four people in our crisis beds right now. We have four crisis beds, every person's homeless. So we are challenged with finding them housing. Um, and our crisis beds are 24 seven. Um, we have another person in the emergency department who just got evicted from a community care home and that was for smoking and fire hazard. Um, so that person is, um, is in the emergency room. And then we have uh, six people actually currently in hotels uh, receiving some services from economic services as well as us. So that's a lot for us on this high needs and we do not have any more dollars for these high needs wraps that um, really probably every one of these people could use in order to get the support just to get back on their feet and into a living space that's healthier. We had another woman who was at the hilltop and just her anxiety was off the chart because she was so frightened there. Um, there's a lot of noise and hollering and she couldn't maintain. So we were able to move her to one of our crisis beds and she remains homeless. So another example um, of some of the challenge and what the numbers of people um, that we have who will be stuck or are stuck in the system. So, you know, those are buckets, intensive case management to a wraparound service. And as Tony said, there's a lot of folks on that side also, um, you know, 50 some odd percent in that medium to low who we could really, you know, we're probably doing some outpatient service or capstone is or um, family center. And we can, we got a really good shot at helping them. The hub idea um, is, a, is an area where we think we have a lot of hope for being able to have a dignified place for people to come where we can bridge our services together, where we can work better together so that we're not being redundant in any of our services. And I actually don't think we do that as much as we work on coordination. Um, it, it really takes quite a lot of us to wrap um, these folks in a way into what they need. Um, and so, you know, everyone needs a different touch. And I think what we recognize if is that we need to respect those different um, and different levels of needs that might come up. And, and we know as a system, and I just wanna say this because Tony mentioned the sharing, we have a program called The Nest and people live together and do quite well there actually. Um, four people in an apartment and they, they learn life skills and they go on sometimes to live together. And it's not, it's not the state's, um, certainly hasn't been um, forte to believe that we should have shared housing units. It's really an aspiration we have for people. And I've done this for a very long time. I'm getting old. And we have aspired for people to live independently. It's a, we, it's a wonderful thing. Think of, you know, we, some of us live alone, but not, not always and sometimes not usually. And so um, I'd like us to examine that aspiration. And uh, Tony and I have talked about this in our group and allow for people to do some shared arrangements. And that would help us to get people housed better. So I kind of leave on that note as we talk about our buckets and needs for people and um, um, take questions as you might have them. Great, thank you so much, Mary. Um, I have two lined up here, Representative, Tri uh, Representative Triano and then Walls. Thank you, Mary, it's good to see you again. And um, you know, I, I did, uh, Hi Heartbeat uh, is in my district, and I, I'm a friend of theirs. And when I see what they do with these with developmentally disabled adults, um, I am inspired. It's just wild how those folks live. And when I sit with them at lunch, and they tell me how great it is to collect eggs in the morning, and <laughs> you yeah. know, so it's just a really a fantastic model, and I'm just inspired by it. But the questions I have, uh, just a few. Um, in the wrap services that you referred to, those come from your CRT budget. Is that uh, safe to say? Yes. Uh, yes, with the exception of the outpatient piece. Okay. And um, are 
is that budget sufficient to see what you're dealing with right now or to deal with what you're seeing now, I should say? No, 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 no. My, my point, um, thank you, uh, Representative Triana. My point in those that are homeless is, is that um, we have one housing specialist and we don't have, um, we have a struggle with getting uh, affordable housing units to open up. We're really working hard at relationship with landlords and we're trying to be innovative. Um, as much as we can. So uh, I think we have a couple of ideas that are hopeful around supporting them. And we have what's called a housing contingency fund. Housing contingency fund uh, that we receive for our CRT population or in our bundle now that we receive from uh, Department of Mental Health allows us to pay back rents or um, help with property destruction or whatever it might be. And we eat that up really quickly. I think one thing we might think about is that uh, not all agencies eat that whole bundle up and it would be great to see what's left on the table and perhaps share around for those that aren't using it all. Yeah. Just the other question that was just curious um, if you have uh, uh, any knowledge of, you talked about uh, mental health services and we all, we all, at least I've heard that uh, of the um, increased uh, depression and anxiety as a result of this COVID uh, Shutdown and people, um, as uh, uh, as we heard, uh, that um, um, mental health and substance abuse issues are often exacerbated by isolation, and that's really been an issue. Have you have you been? Or can you tell me that whether some of these crises that are happening are existing mental health conditions that are exacerbated by COVID, or are they um, uh, episodic uh, as a result of? Uh, being hunkered down for three months. Uh, do you have a handle on those numbers, Mary? Well, I, we're beginning to see an increase and in, we don't have numbers yet except in outpatient where we've seen an increase in services of about 20% yeah. of those that I would say are wanting some supports around how to live in isolation. But we saw increases in psychosis within the third week of those with serious mental illness. And we are now seeing more of a surge. We had hardly anyone in the ERs for the first, um, you know, several weeks. Uh, we had nine people waiting for beds last weekend at Central Vermont Medical Center. And I would say that's directly related to people really um, trying to do the very best they could, even with many touches that we provided uh, to stay in isolation is extremely difficult and exacerbates those conditions. That's what I thought. Thank you. Senator Walls. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Uh, I have a question dealing with long term and, and housing vouchers. And it strikes me some of the population you're talking about, the really uh, de de developmentally delayed, for example, and the really seriously mental, uh, mentally ill folks might have issues that are going to go on for decades, potentially. And just how does that work with housing vouchers? Do they have to constantly reapply? No, they, they uh, so there's a, Department of Mental Health provides a, um, a housing voucher um, for many of our folks. And Tony, I always get these mixed up, but it's Shelter Plus Care, help me out. Um, yeah, Shelter Plus Care? So yes, so Shelter, yes, shelter Plus Care. Plus, they're so close in the way that they're named. Um, yeah. And then there's housing subsidies. So yeah, so shelter plus care is what our folks get. And they um, they have case managers that assist them um, with reviews on that, but they hold on to those vouchers. And um, we're very fortunate with the Department of Mental Health to be able to access that level of voucher. It What I'll say about the vouchers is, and this is this is not for the long-term because they, they get vouchers. It's for those that fall between the cracks, the flexibility within the vouchers. I just wish there was more flexibility and um, not everybody wants to engage with services. And we really recognize that. And I'd love to bust the stigma and we really work on that and say, hey, just, you know, um, we'll give you a little bit of help, but the voucher requires that there is a certain level of assistance and the vouchers off and in the outpatient world can be directly related to the level of assistance, the amount of the voucher to the level of assistance that's provided. Um, so that value 
can shift based on the person's engagement and really do wish there was more flexibility involved there. And do you have a specific proposal for that or? <laughs> I don't, Ang Angus or Tony might, you know, Angus worked in okay. this uh, All right. field. Thank, but... you. Thank you, Mary. I could jump in with that. Um, we have discussed as a community, the idea of having a uh, non-categorical case manager. So somebody, a housing case manager housed at Capstone who is not a specific mental health uh, provider, but who has access to uh, clinical supervision from Washington County Mental Health, so that people who either don't recognize that they have a mental health disorder, mm -hmm. or who, um, for whatever reason, are just not willing or able to engage in that level of services right now, could come to Capstone, where it's, you know, normal folks who do uh, housing support, and they can get the long-term needs uh, met at Capstone. Um, so that is our our hope. Um, our proposal. Folks, yeah, our hope and our proposal for the folks who um, who just can't uh, engage on that level with Washington County. Thank you, Tony. Um, I'm going to pop right over to Angus. Angus, welcome back. Um, thank you very much. I think I, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. So, uh, good to see you all again for the, for the zoom record. My name is Angus Cheney. I'm the executive director of the homeless prevention center. And just for some context, we're a community based nonprofit. Um, and we've served, uh, 500 Vermonters last year who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. And we celebrated 20 years of service to our community. Uh, we're, understandably busy as both Tony and Mary have alluded to uh, at the moment as we try to not only assess a very large number of people who are in motels as a result of COVID-19, but then ultimately work to uh, help them get rehoused. Um, I'll provide some data on that in a, little, in a little bit. I would say fortunately we have to, to keep doing this work. We have to really focus on what is working and not be demoralized by the scale of the challenge. So. I would say, uh, fortunately, we have a number of case management programs at HPC. We're, we're a specialty agency. So we've got a supportive housing program for families that's been mentioned, family supportive housing. Housing first program for individuals with more complex needs. We've also got lighter touch prevention and rehousing programs for people whose crisis can be resolved with, for instance, uh, financial assistance and short-term technical assistance. Also the, a landlord liaison and a small uh, housing navigation program that's new for us that's targeted to serve young adults 18 to 24, as well as a transitional housing program for offenders and a few emergency apartments that we use for short-term shelter. So when a client needs services beyond what I just mentioned, uh, we have partnerships and systems in place to make those connections. And we were encouraged to see, we, we, we undertook a fairly large push recently to outreach everybody we could uh, contact at the motels. And I would say encouraged to see that many of the people we met there um, won't need longer term case management, but it's uh, certainly technical assistance. It's the move in costs, it's maybe a subsidy and then certainly access to a unit. Um, one of the frustrations which perhaps you've seen or the administration sees is um, it really is about bringing these things up in parallel. You can dump endless amounts of case management on a community, but if there aren't the units, then it's not well spent. You could do the same thing with just the units or just the subsidies, right? And I know you're all familiar with that idea of getting the, the balance right on your services, your financial assistance and your access to units. I did, I am gonna send uh, these notes on after we finish up the, the hearing, I'll, I'll send these notes on if people are um, uh, trying to keep up with notes. I, I want to summarize, I, I was sort of clarifying what we were talking about today uh, with Ron yesterday, and it sounds like it would be good to just sort of get into this idea, this, this broad term of homeless services. And I think both Tony and Mary have explained it really well. So I didn't disagree with anything they said. I'm also just going to share, you know, Rutland County perspective and HPC perspective, how we make sense of this big um, array of services. And I'll, I'll focus on the ones we're able to provide uh, here and then certainly can try to field questions on 
those services provided by partner organizations. I think where you wanna start, and this will, this will go right back to Tony's great introduction around uh, coordinate entry, start by taking um, the assessment and breaking that off separately from case management. So we'll sort of do this sequentially as if you were a client coming into the system of care. And I wanna talk about what that assessment is about. The, the reason for it is really to establish and uh, to establish eligibility and prioritize people for the various housing programs that are out there. Uh, so that's that can be financial assistance, subsidy, and services. Um, provide a more complete understanding of the whole family short and long-term needs and help us learn from their history what about our collective approach may need to be modified to improve results. We're going to elicit a lot of information during that assessment. I think um, when it's done well, it's a conversation, but um, I can also understand if I put myself in the shoes of somebody being assessed and I'm a, you know, a Vermonter and I kind of keep to myself and I, I can really question why we'd be, at, we'd be asking all the questions that we do of people. The goal is not to um, pry into people's lives and make them uncomfortable. The goal is to sort of break a cycle of homelessness perhaps, and say this will be more work at the front end. This might even feel like a delay, but ideally you're not back here a year from now or two years from now, because we're, the goal is to match you with the program that's gonna serve you best. So that's in a nutshell assessments. Um, and that, and I, I, we can certain one, so one of our challenges is just as a homeless services agency, keeping up with the volume of people who have been in motels. I was talking to our program supervisor this morning, and I would estimate, you know, as of today, uh, we've assessed roughly half of all the households who are homeless in Rutland County, which means um, that that can mean lots of things about how why we can't contact the other half or uh, what their either their challenges are or our challenges are to completing that. Um, but the data that I share around who is homeless and what their needs are, just remember that's maybe only half the story. And, and until we get through that assessment, we wouldn't know answers to questions like what size apartment will they need? What type of services will they need for how long, et cetera. Uh, to give you some scale of that assessment work, we haven't gone to the case management yet. Uh, two, we've completed 262 of those assessments in Rutland uh, this year, since, since the start of the state fiscal year. And um, 85, households moved off the master list. That's the county level list of everybody who's homeless, moved off the master list into permanent destinations. So hang on to that because you're gonna need some good news as we talk through the reality of where, of where we are in Vermont right now. And I, I, I don't wanna leave out, um, I don't want people to come away thinking that this is, this is hopeless and let's just go solve another problem because we don't know where to begin with this one. Um, but I will say, just to give you some sense of the scale, before we were able to um, get information about this group that's in motels, um, and I think you all know why, why everybody was in motels and not other shelters and not on the streets, so I won't go into that. Our understanding prior to COVID-19 was that there were roughly 37 households who were homeless in Rutland County on the master list. And it's jumped to, let's see, I think it's 109 households today, and we know that isn't everybody. We know that um, we haven't been able to connect with 100% of the people who are in motels. So I want to shift to case management now. The assessment is really the first step now in this um, HUD required state developed approach of coordinated entry. So let's talk about case management. And I, the other thing I want to add is that not everybody who's homeless needs case management. If we can help somebody stabilize without um, enrolling them in a long-term program, let's be honest, who wants to be in a program? We'd much rather have housing than another program. So if we can do that, we do. And, and we're, we're, we've developed a lot of uh, agility in the last two years to say, no, let's not do a full enrollment. Let's, let's, move, move, let's get some moving costs out the door. Let's do some technical assistance with uh, uh, housing search and brokering with landlords. And so we have a number of staff here who are really good at that housing navigation. Um, so really quick through case management, and then I'm gonna split that into three areas, if you'll bear with me. So case management, what I see, um, and that, that's a big part of what our organization is doing. We are identifying a client's goals and barriers. Getting their goals early is, is so key to getting them engaged with it. 
the successes that I brag about are very much the successes of our clients as much as anything else. So identifying goals and barriers, developing strategies that are customized to those goals and barriers, providing technical assistance, as I alluded to, and support to help a client achieve those goals and then other goals. So um, all still under the broad category of case management, um, housing case management, let's talk about you know, assisting with applications, finding housing, that's big, right? Uh, accessing subsidy and securing moving costs. Another piece of this is that as we develop rapport with clients that we're working with, we get to know them better. We get to know some of the other areas outside housing in which they want assistance. So some of those other, other domains, which are also gonna be critical to their stability, uh, either critical to convincing a landlord to take a chance or keeping them a, a, a tenant in good standing once they're leased up. So that's gonna include accessing benefits, um, which is a job in itself, right? completing education, securing employment, increasing income or savings and improving credit, accessing mental health or substance abuse treatment. So those are really broadly and probably leaving a lot out. That's how we, we view case management here. Just to really get geeky with it for a minute, when we talk about housing case management, this is what I'm talking about. It's three areas of homelessness prevention, housing navigation and rehousing and housing retention. I know that this committee is really well versed in a lot of this um, approach, but I'm just going to quickly run through again, if for anybody's new or wants a refresher. So homelessness prevention is really just what it sounds like. It's financial assistance and case management with the goal of preventing homelessness for a household at imminent risk, right? In our world, you've really got to demonstrate that, that imminent risk. It's not, broadly speaking, upstream work. Number two, housing navigation and rehousing. Identify new housing for people who cannot stay where they are or are already homeless. And this can include accessing subsidy, getting moving costs together and getting a client through the lease up process. Think of that lease up process as a demarcation point because the work we're gonna do after that is housing retention. This has been the big shift, I would say nationwide in the last decade is to invest in housing retention and not stop all the work when someone signs a lease, but to realize we can break cycles of instability by providing the right amount of services post lease up, uh, not smothering people with it, but not, uh, but being available uh, with the supports they need. And this is again, where housing focused case management morphs into other areas. So this is where you're gonna learn that, oh, someone had an untreated chronic condition that, that they hadn't had a chance to deal with. It hadn't risen to the level of uh, urgency. And so we're, we might be connecting people with people who can provide those services. Um, and working on parenting and assisting with uh, getting people counseling. Um, and I'll just, just to, to give you sort of a rough sense of scale of the last two I mentioned, the navigation rehousing and the housing retention, this is currently a snapshot. We're providing that housing navigation and rehousing to 59 households, that's over 110 people. And that housing retention is six, a, a different 64 households that's over 130 people. I know there was interest in sort of where do we draw the lines, and especially as we think about um, federal uh, allowability with, with special funds and what we, so I wanna be clear about what we do and what we can't do, um, or at least aren't currently trained to do. So we're definitely, as I mentioned, a specialist organization. Uh, we assist around housing. I would say most of our staff, if not almost all of our staff are able to provide housing case management. But what we're looking is we're developing programs based on the need that we see in Rutland. And then we're recruiting um, based on people who have, might have a special skill set, training, or interest in that population. So we've got people who come to work for us who have not only an interest in, in helping people who are homeless, but a real knack for working with um, families and kids. And so they're going to naturally be in our family supportive housing program. Same would be true for a corrections program or a, a housing first program that we run in partnership with a, the local designated agency to provide supports for people with mental illness or substance abuse. Um, I know there's interest in sort of how, how intense these services are, and I've got to say there's no one answer. The intensity and duration of services varies widely, both within program and then even down at the individual level. So we have people, when we go back and read our case notes, we can see we were working with them every day on something, and, and it, the truest statement would be to say they were in crisis um, prior to being housed, and then they had some crisis uh, even after they were housed. And then that same person or family, we may 
uh, jump ahead a year and they're doing great. You know, they're stable in all the domains that we're measuring and we're um, checking in with them just once a month. And, and who knows that after time we can even transition to, to full, um, you don't need us anymore. And um, that's sometimes interesting as you would guess, if you've got a background in human services, that can be tough for both the client and the case manager sometimes when you're sort of ending that um, long, that relationship that's developed over time. And we always try to say, we're gonna be here if things change and don't be uh, shy about getting back in touch with us. Uh, the lastly here, I'm winding down, um, we don't provide we don't directly provide health services and we don't um, assist with activities of daily living and such as bathing and that sort of thing. We don't provide clinical treatment. We're not licensed to do that. So we're working with our partners to make sure our clients have all the services that they need. Um, so uh, coordinate entry helps us do that, but, but it's no substitute for just knowing who you're who your local players are and developing uh, good working relationships with them so that you can make those referrals. And I think we've been really lucky in Rutland County, um, as much as we struggle like every county for the grand solution that is that will end homelessness. I think people are doing a fantastic job here of bringing what they can to the table uh, of, of approaching this in with a solution in mind as opposed to judging people. And um, I'm, I'm excited to work in, in Rutland County and get the the buy-in from all the different uh, partners here. And um, so that, for instance, there was a question around SASH. And so we would, uh, it just makes it that much better when we have someone who we know is, is homeless and would also benefit from SASH type services. I'm in touch with Kevin Loso with the Housing Authority and we're sort of talking that through and making sure that that, that would be a, a seamless transition or um, somebody who might be able to get services from an area agency on aging and we're, maybe have some special options about where we can apply for housing. Uh, we've made great use of these mainstream vouchers in Rutland. These are a great tool. If your community isn't uh, pursuing them, they should. So that's a, a federally backed subsidy for people who are non-elderly and disabled. It happens that a lot of our clients are in that position, but for whatever reason, they're slightly, they're slightly easier to access than a federal shelter plus care or a, a department of mental health subsidy and care. So they've been a, a real, um, they've helped us so much recently that we're running out of one bedroom apartments now because it was typically one bedroom households who qualified for those. So now we have a lot of vouchers on hand. We've got great partnerships in place and all of us are beating the thickets for one bedroom units, particularly ground floor accessible. Last piece here, uh, administrative work. There was a question on uh, are the services we provide administrative. I wasn't exactly sure what, what, what the committee's question was on that, but I'll, as we sort of thought about what we do, we thought of maybe five areas that, that would qualify. So administration of short and medium term rental subsidy. This year, we've directly provided over 180,000 from our budget to provide client financial assistance. And that's not including what we leverage um, and access for clients outside like uh, state and federal subsidy. Uh, client case noting is administrative, at least it feels it. It's, um, it's important work and something people have to try to do at the end of their day. Uh, recertifications, attending team meetings, and then lots and lots of data entry. And so that's the world we live in. Um, that's probably the toughest part of the, the work is um, make, keeping the computers happy after the end of the work day. But it's stuff that has to happen so that we can continue to do the work we're doing and, and ac continue to access um, the other uh, assistance outside our organization. So um, that's most of what I had. I was basically nodding my head to what the other two witnesses were saying. It's consistent in terms of the, the percentages of what uh, Tony was presenting around uh, the scale of the challenge, the, the general percentages of where people are falling in terms of needing short, medium, or long-term. Um, I really um, empathize with the challenge that Mary talks about. That's really poignant. Um, and I, once again, I think I'll leave you with a positive. Uh, we, in one week with this mad push with everybody trying to do assessments as well as provide case management during COVID, we housed, uh, rehoused six families that were homeless. Uh, within 30 days, we've also uh, rehoused within the last, um, couple weeks, we've rehoused two men who were chronically homeless. Um, and 
a lot of, I think a lot of the community assumed that would always be the case. And next week we're gonna house another one of those men. So, so three chronically homeless individuals uh, who have keys to their own apartments within 30 days uh, really feels good. And um, I just wanted to, to share that with you. So thank you very much uh, for, for asking me to sort of present on this and take any questions at the committee or chairs, pleasure. I have one I have representative Triano, but before that, just do you know offhand, Angus, um, what the vacancy rate is in Rutland these days? You said you were running out of one bedroom apartments. And I'm just curious, not only in terms of what you would need, but also when we start thinking about the um, enhanced VHIP program that the government, that the administration has proposed in terms of bringing offline apartments online, what's, what's the vacancy rate right now? That, 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 yeah. In Rutland. I'm I'm not as current on the local vacancy rate as I'd like to be, but I think what's even more important is how many units are are available that are both under HUD's FMR and will meet housing quality standards. That's the only pool we're interested in. So a, a vacancy rate of a high-end um, condo that's or or something so substandard that we can't with good conscience put somebody in there. I sort of take those out of the mix and I'm, I'm we're looking at um, that intersection of there's enough quality uh, but the cost is reasonable um, and I I it, it had it does change over time what's interesting is that I'm I've been here just long enough to see that flip when I started here there were a lot of one bedrooms had a really hard time finding twos and threes for families and people told me that would flip and I didn't believe them and sure enough they were they were correct it's now it's the ones we can't find so we're potentially people who are looking at over being overhoused, uh, a couple uh, that would be looking at a two bedroom be just because they can't find a one. That that makes me feel queasy because I know that we could get more people in that apartment, if you will. Um, but I don't have a great answer, uh, Rep Stevens, on the on the true vacancy rate for the county. No, that's fair. Thank you. Representative Triano. Um, Hi, thanks for coming today, Angus. Uh, I feel like I should use a Scottish accent when I say your name. <laughs> but uh, um, so where do you get your referrals from? Uh, so when we analyze this, um, we analyze this a couple times a year, the majority of our referrals um, are, are self-referrals. So we're well known enough in the community that people are calling 775-9287 um, and then uh, you know, when we look at, when we break out among everybody else, um, a lot, uh, historically a lot from economic services. Uh, that's been fewer recently, um, and I'm, we're still figuring out why, but, and then probably evenly split, you get down into the single digits, you get, uh, you're looking at the Rutland Regional Medical Center, you're looking at um, other providers like us who know that we're the specialist agency. United Way. Uh huh. That's good to know. Um, the other question is you mentioned um, housing um, uh, three homeless, chronically homeless uh, men in the past week or so. <clears throat> Do you rely on your local mental health agency for services for those folks? How does that work? We've got a, We've got two um, two options for for serving that population, and and actually more than that, I would say. Um, if you have a mental illness and are homeless it, in Rutland County, it's not that you're guaranteed to end up in a program for people who are homeless with mental illness. We're probably serving people in that group across every program, which I think is important in terms of mainstreaming. Um, we have learned over time that um, we can, when we really focus and reduce caseloads and, and, and build up training, that it makes sense to have some specialist programs as well. In, at, in our uh, in Rutland, we have at least of the ones we're involved in, involved with, we have the PATH program and we have the Welcome Home Partnership that we do with Rutland Mental Health. And so sometimes it's just um, the vagary of which subsidy landed and which, which, which opened up which door, or it's where we have capacity. But uh, together, I'm thinking roughly 30 people that are served between those two programs. And it looks a lot like a, a housing first um, program, but it relies more on partnerships as opposed to a unilateral agency approach. Yeah, good. That's very good to know. Thank you.
Representative Howard. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to say thank you to, to Mary, Tony, and, and Angus for the work that you do. Um, it is just, it's heart-wrenching for me to think about homeless people, especially children, uh, being housed in a motel. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for the work you do. Um, uh, I also wanted to mention, um, Angus, that I've had recently a couple conversations with the director of the United Way, and she has um, informed me of the collaboration between the agencies, you know, with yourself and Kevin Loso, and um, and I think that's great. Uh, I really do. Um, thank you again for 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 what you do. I appreciate it. There wasn't a question there, was there, Mary? All right, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Angus and Tony and Mary. And again, you're, um, this has been very informative. This is kind of what I wanted to hear. Um, I wanted our committee to hear. Um, again, the hardest part moving forward between now and starting to utilize the uh, Corona Relief Fund for housing purposes or for housing homeless purposes is going to be this service component and you know, these one and a half of the, the legs of the stool really um, and making sure that it gets out to agencies like yours in a way or first of all to, to find out to try to convince people that we can use it this way or get permission to use it this way and then um, because it's it's clear that we at the ground level certainly know how to get it done and it sounds like you know the, the arguments have always been about capacity whether it's been real estate or whether it's been services and so um this is this is what we're trying to do tony thank you for filling us in on what the coordinated entry is i mean it gives me confidence to know that if we you know as we start to build these programs that we'll be able to look at the coordinated entry program and say, well, we, you know, yes, we have 2000 um, individuals or 1500 households, but maybe we only need 600 new units or whatever the number is that, you know, to, to go across or, or Angus, as you said, if it's, um, if it's first last, you know, if it's a rental situation and then um, Mary, I think you mentioned medium supports, medium time or Tony, you know, the, the, the ability to be trained on how to be a, a, a tenant. Um, those, I'm, I'm confident that we can find that information by calling the right people um, to really hone it down, which sort of makes it, um, and, and, and Angus, I appreciate your positive outlook and, what we can do and what we have done. Um, it really takes the pressure off of the, um, the size of the issue that's in front of us. Um, but again, with knowing that this is the information that we have and it's the best information we've had about this population ever, um, I'm hoping we take advantage of that and really develop the programs that we need. Um, I think in my experience, it's been very difficult to convince other people that the problem exists um, to a bigger size than what we knew. Um, but also, and I'll echo Mary's comments, it's just been, um, thank you for the work that you do um, and, and, for the, and for the Michigas you have to put up with the legislature um, in order to get your work done. Please feel free to stay um, during this part of the conversation where I'm going to talk about what is in front of us as a committee as we, um, based on the information that I, was, I received yesterday. So. Um, switching gears committee I'm, I'm gonna read most of the email that i received from the speaker yesterday um so the speaker and and the senate pro tem have been working um and in consultation with the administration over time of course but that um, about what the general assembly's response should be using the using the 1.25 billion dollars that we received from the federal government to um, address the COVID crisis. And we've had a lot of conversation in this committee about how we know that there's an element of the service component of, of our work that is gonna be hard to get approval for. But that said, um, this is this is what the, the speaker shared with me yesterday. Um, 
So there are two targets. Um, it's critical to get CRF money into the hands of Vermonters as quickly as possible. The process is an attempt to give, this process is an attempt to give you some guidance on approximately how much money your committee has to consider. There are two targets given. The first block of money is for your top priority items that are the most critical and the most time sensitive. Across all committees, this adds up to a total of $575 million. This will become effective upon passage and will be available for Vermonters as soon as possible. The second block of money is a total of 400 million. For the committee's purposes, this is for second tier priorities or if you choose additional money for first priority projects. This will have to wait for available funds. Right now, this $400 million is being held back to be able to fill the holes in August in the Ed Fund, which is $150 million, the General Fund, which is $200 million, and Transportation Funds, which is $48 million, in case the federal rules change to allow that. If the US Senate agrees to some version of the HEROES Act, which was passed by the House, and more money becomes available for states while we're adjourned in July and August, the emergency board will be authorized to allocate these funds according to legislation. The door quickly is key to making sure it can help Vermont before it expires on December 31st. Be aware that as of the speaker's last conversation with the administration, they are recommending that all funds, spending all funds now while gambling with larger holes in the budgets in August. So for the big picture, $275 million has already been allocated joint, through the joint fiscal process, through budget adjustment, a transitional budget, and the municipal lending bill. $400 million is being held to fill budget holes or for second tier committee priorities, leaving $575 million for first tier committee priorities. For the Committee on General Housing and Military Affairs, your targets are for your first tier priority appropriations, $75 million. And for the second tier priority appropriations, $50 million. This amount is for any CRF proposals recommended by your committee, including any or all of the governor's proposals that you support. These amounts allow you to get to work, but there are no promises. We may have to rebalance the committee target numbers as we move through the process. The goals we established at the outset of this shutdown were to protect the health of Vermonters, to meet the, help meet the basic needs of Vermonters, and establish a path to a strong economic recovery, all with an eye towards how we could apply some of this money to put us in a better position in 2021 and beyond. The speaker repeats um, that these numbers are iterative. They are targets so that you have a sense of what magnitude you're working with. If your committee comes up with something very impactful outside your budget, we can reevaluate. On the other end of the spectrum, if your committee is struggling to find one-time COVID-related investments that can be completed by December 31st that fit the ever-narrowing federal parameters, it's totally fine to say that we have three projects spending just this much money and the rest should go to something more in line with current needs. Thank you for your continued dedication to the people and state we serve. So um, that's, that's where we are. Um, the money that is listed uh, is I think very generally in line with what we've been talking about. If we were to do um, nothing more than what we heard from the administration and what we've heard from uh, the HCB in particular or others, we'd be at close to $90 million, which include actually just over $90 million, which included um, services that we, which still include services that we may not be able to use the money for. So we're actually in theory um, without any further review, which I think is not what we're going to do. We're going to review top to bottom, what we're able to do with the money. Um, but we're very cl close to that first target. Um, and then the second tier 
is in it, it, to me is an interesting concept of it's it's uh where we have to balance off for instance to use as an example if we were to just pull push forward the administration's proposal for rental assistance and eviction protection at 40 to, to use that number 42 million dollars and we know that um that money would be available to you be used for evictions or back rents starting from may 1 until december 30th if that's what we decided that it that, that's the range the question is do you an example of the questions that are in front of us is do we say in tier one 30 million dollars goes to rental eviction protection and then plan on an extra 12 million dollars or whatever might be needed in when we when we find out in August, you know, and if 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 we have the money to spend on tier two, so those are the converse, those are the kinds of conversations that we're going to have. I think over the next several uh, over our next several meetings, we have three scheduled. Um, we have tomorrow from one to three. We have Tuesday, uh, our normal eleven to one, and then on Wednesday we have. Um, we were the schedule on Wednesday was changed to accommodate the fact that the deadline for us to get this information to appropriations is noon next Wednesday. Um, we'll be meeting at 830 on Wednesday morning from 830 to 1030 on the 10th. Um, and that's when we'll wrap up our our work on this uh, on this um, essentially portion of the bill. So with that, I'm going to um, unmute everybody if everybody, everybody wants to um, have a conversation about what you just heard. Uh, let's we can we can be free form or you can raise your hand and we'll just um, go around the circle here. Are we dumb? I guess. Yeah, no, Are I, we I mean, stunned? I guess, I guess my plan isn't necessarily around what we heard today, but um, just going through the details in the draft with David Hall. What's the timeline for that? Um, I suspect we're going to be able to finally get him on Friday. Okay. Uh, he has been, he has been um, hard to get. But he he will have had um, by the time we see him on Friday, um, he will be able to follow up on conversations with um, the conversations he's had with Commerce, and he will be able to guide us more. I mean, this, I mean, so much of this is um, when I was able to talk to him briefly this week, he reminded just like S three thirty three, what we're working on is session law, so yeah. it's law that is specifically that that's in effect specifically from now from the time it passes and gets signed into law until the time we say it ends so it's not it's not deep-seated <clears throat> statute um like we this again this is approaching it just like we did in, in with s333 <laughs> this is basically saying here is here is this program here is this money this is how it has to be spent and this sure. is how we you know so we'll we'll get him on we'll get him on friday okay because that's i mean we've been taking all this testimony but i really and I understand why all of these stakeholders and individual parties are coming in to discuss this with us, but I just haven't seen any real structure or walk through the structure with any, any depth to understand how this stuff's going to apply to it. Um, you and me both, but you know, cool. it's, it's no, uh, I'm not alone. <laughs> no. Um, what we have heard from, from um, the, administration and from the uh, advocates are requests to be considered and um, and so that's that's where we are now I mean there are going to be elements of this that the for me the difficult part is to say well how do you administer the 42 million dollars for for rental assistance do you yeah, I think under under a different circumstance, we might say, well, well Capstone needs one hundred and fifty thousand, and and NECA needs one hundred and fifty thousand, and and you know OEO and Champlain might need five hundred thousand. I mean, the, the, those are individual things, but I think that we're thinking broader than that. Like like what one agency 
can handle those requests um, rather than us making that decision in in our time. You know, where where there's processes that say, um, you know, Capstone may know how to deal with a different organization in terms of, um, and hopefully it wouldn't be a 15 or 30 page application for the amount of money that they needed to do it. So, so we're all, you know, we have, we, we have a breakdown from, from VHCB is $21 million enough for the <clears throat> capital purchases that they've been talking about yeah. is 25. I mean, we heard from, we heard from uh, uh, Jonathan Bond this week. We heard, we did not hear from Angus, but I know that in Rutland, there's a project that maybe one or two different motels that might be turned into uh, almost hub type situations as, as was discussed earlier. I, I don't think yeah. we're in a, place where we're doing those line items, but we're trying to give VHCB the amount, you know, so that they're the agency that deals with it. And I, and I understand that, I mean, given the time constraints that we're under with this, I mean, uh, trust me, I, with the, the people that I'm speaking to in housing and also just the financial components on the economic relief side for the, the impacted businesses, like, trust me, I'm like, hey, let's, let's put the pedal down and get this moving. I'm just trying to understand right now like you just said, it's like, is, are we doing a bigger construct for the larger organizations to carry more responsibility with how to attic allocate it? I just, you know, we're at Wednesday right or Thursday right now, and I'm just trying to figure out which way the like sort of scheduling ship is being steered to get this done on time. It is going to be fast thinking, and um, okay. the only the only. Um, thing that you know is that this does still have to go to the senate so if we made egregious errors in our calculations then then there's another place where it may go uh it'll be on the floor and so you know we will discuss this on the floor so it is um no it is it's it's um it's interesting i think i think and and the the i think the biggest issue that is the, the biggest possible wrench in the works is the federal government and the, and the treasury suggestions. I mean, they're not even rules. They're not even regulations. They're just suggestions uh, that the treasury is doing. So it's not like it's law. Nope. Um, they're just saying, you know, Matt, you can take the car, but you can't go to Barry. You no, know, totally. and, and they're doing the same thing with like the CARES Act stuff with the with the idol and the PPP stuff. It's like every couple of weeks you get new interim rules yeah. that you know are, are kind of are, are point counterpoint with what the previous rules were. As soon as you're done interpreting them, they change them. No, I, I hear you. Right, and so we may be in a position where we put together a package of of, of protections, and I and I would you know, and one of the things that I say when I talk about mm -hmm. things in draft forms, I say put a bracket around something, right? So mm -hmm. there's something that you can identify as it could be deleted, um, or the decision hasn't been made on it. Would be, uh, you know, I mean, I want to keep any requests we make for services out in the, the open, but at noon on Wednesday, if we don't have a ruling on it that we can use it in this way, then it comes right out. It has to come right out. Um, we can't force, you know, the, the, there's not a lot of momentum to just do what we want and then sort it out later. We have to be responsible with it. So Representative Walls. Yeah, well, a couple, a couple of things, Tom. Uh, first of all, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of follow along with what Matt was just saying. I just wonder, if the easiest way forward for us now is just to go with our traditional providers and split up the money. But uh, I want to be clear on the tier one, tier two. Uh, it sounds like a, a certain amount of money is being set aside for tier two in order to get clarification from the feds. Is that what I heard you say? Yes. Yes. So there's we have holes in our budget uh, due to the COVID crisis. Right. Um, and that's what was listed out, um, 48 million in the transportation fund, uh, which may be because, maybe partially because we're just not driving. So there's not a lot of taxes being collected or it may just changes in what the federal government can give. Um, clearly a $150 million hole in, uh, I think that it was $150 million hole in the property, in the education fund. Um, and then there was a $200 million hole in, um, what was the third piece? Um, 
the $200 million hole in the general fund. Mm -hmm. Right okay. now, the rules are, the treasury rules are that we cannot spend the money for these projects. Right, okay, yes, and I understand that. So, so this is just a set aside, and if it, it turns out that the Fed say, no, 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 absolutely, you can't do any of those things, then potentially that money could become available to us to do more of what we're trying to do. Yes, and so our job in the tier two portion, again, is to decide, you know, maybe is to decide whether or not we have secondary priorities or it's second, considered a secondary funding um, in ways that, again, maybe by August services will be allowed. Uh, the, the ones that we're seeking, maybe they'll say, yes, these are capital services and these are necessary for the financial viability of any new purchases that you make in order to house the homeless. And it's very specific. It's not about creating capacity for any other group of people that we do this work for. You know, it really is specifically to increase, you know, the, the health and public safety of the homeless population. Now that's a double-edged sword, right? Because you're cre you're increasing capacity in order to do that, um, but it is this specific. And David will be able to break it down a little bit for for us. But you'll get as frustrated as as I I think as leadership is as as we all are in terms of um, what the definitions of the words mean, and also again. Um, again, how the money can be used and what's necessary. So Gus Seeley can come in and say, well, we do projects this way. And so, and it's allowed with, with, with federal money, but this bill, this CARES Act is, 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 is not allowing it that way. So um, that is a big, that is a big, um, and, and I've said this a month ago where I, I'm, I'm anxious about going down into the rabbit hole of, solving some really long-standing problems than to be told later that we can't do it that way. And yet here we are on the precipice of the rabbit hole still without um, <laughs> guidance that we can really in, really trust. So, um, you know, one pill makes it larger and all that. So um, Representative Zott. Uh, I, th I think actually you kind of um, you kind of covered what my apprehension is around this because it without knowing the services side of things it does seem a little sketchy to be allocating money for housing that will ultimately fail if it doesn't have the services associated with it and so is there some way that we're going to uh, setting aside the cares or the CRF money altogether is there a way that we can work in concert with human services or do we know what appropriations is going to be doing with the general fund money to in terms of supporting these services and has there been any discussion of deficit spending we are in the economic situation in the state and maybe there needs to be some serious discussion about doing some deficit spending in this arena um so I'm not aware of any ideas about deficit spending that we, we are, we pride ourselves, I guess, on being the only state that allows ourselves to deficit spend if necessary, but we don't. Um, so I don't, I have not been privy to that conversation at all. Um, in terms of human services and others, um, there are some people that we need to check out in terms of, in terms of, um, where service money might be available. Uh, in conversations with the, that I've had with leadership, there's been nothing, you know, nothing promised, nothing written in stone, because of course we can't bind a future legislature and, and, and you know, we can't promise that we're going to bake in service money. And it's one of the biggest problems. It's been the capacity issues for service money has been has been an issue in this legislature for, for many, many years. But there the conversations that I have had in leadership have been have centered around the fact that, well, if you do get the capital money out the door and capital was able to be spent for these um, for these units, for these facilities, well, those services will be much less expensive 
And so it should be easier to fit into the budget. Now, that's not the same thing as guaranteeing that those service, that service money will be there and testimony we've taken from, from VHCB in particular, but others as well is, is that, um, is that a lot of the partners won't, will have a hard time agreeing to do a project if the capital services are not part of the package, you know, for the, to address exactly what you're talking about. Uh, Representative Henko. After we walk through this bill with David and we make any um, recommendations, which I assume are going to be in bill form, not memo form, because at one point you said we might just be writing a memo, um, then the bill will go to appropriations. Yeah, there's a lot of different committees that were that are being um, there. The agriculture committee is working on the the fifty million dollar appropriation suggestion. Uh, but yes, we're this is like a um, I guess it's like a Lego project. Um, we're going to work on our piece and then plug it into what will then be an appropriations bill. Okay, thank you, Representative Kalaki, then Triano. Thank you, Chair. Um, you, you know, I, um, I'm having a hard time understanding sort of um, the architecture of this because we've we've heard a lot of very compelling, um, regionally specific testimony, and some of the emails you shared with us last week. We had great examples of it. Uh, Legal Aid gave us a proposal. They proposed VSHA. When VSHA spoke to us, they said that wouldn't be their proposal. And so I'm, um, I, 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 I wonder if it's that we really need to come up with sort of what the values are in, in this, a, a list of things that, uh, do we want the money regionally specific? And do we want, flexibility with the different regions in our state to do in a responsive way and have it be that whatever agency is handling this money. And so so I, I just need help with all the, all the disparate pieces that, that you've given us and we've been talking about uh, to figure out how to uh, respond sort of with equity uh, around our state mm -hmm. of, uh, with some of these issues. And, so I don't know if on Friday, if, if there's a way you could almost have a, you know, if we were in a, in a, in a, even in our committee room, you could have a whiteboard and you could say, okay, here are these buckets and here's where I think it's really compelling for us to talk about in terms of policy. Uh, Cause I can't get my arms around uh, all the different policy ramifications for us to look at this in a holistic way. I'm, I'm, Sure, I would, I would suggest that, and, and I know that um, uh, by the end of this morning or this afternoon, um, if you have specific, if the committee has specific requests, specific requests would try to get people in. I mean, I was thinking that we would get, um, I mean, one of, the, one of the issues is having enough time to hear from a lot of different people. We have heard from a lot of different people. Um, but, you know, I think look at the materials that we've received over the last several weeks. I think I shared a group of those in an email that are, um, that have a, have a, um, that kind of create the world that we're talking about. Okay. Um, that, you know, in, in essence, you know, is the, cause the question is, do you do you know, that do you do something that's based on, um, you know, you simply say, oh yes, all the money should be going to the, to the counties that have the most need. Well, again, that's, the, that's a value question. You know, if a, if a county, a rural, especially rural county doesn't have a large number of people, doesn't that mean, does that, that doesn't mean that they have less of a need um, mm -hmm. going forward, but there's also, if it's a statewide organization and a statewide organization, if you look at the projects that VHCB has funded through the most recently through the, the, the uh, bond 
uh, through the hundred plus million dollars that was raised through the bond that, you know, it, it, they, they, they do things geographically even um, when the projects are there. So um, as an example, I'm not saying we need to put all our eggs in that basket, but that, um, but I, no, I hear you. And so, so, so again, in the next few minutes or even in the, even in the hours after this meeting, if you have, if you have suggestions of people you want to hear from and we can fit them in tomorrow, cause that is tomorrow. Um, we will get those witnesses in. Um, and, uh, but a lot of this is going to be a review of what we've heard. And um, I, I I, the human services has a big chunk of money too. I don't know what they're going to, we need to find out what they're, I don't want to do repetitious work, for, you know, if, 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 if I know that another agency, another committee is, is focusing on something else. So. It might be that if, if um, you, you're thinking the, the HCB is the, is the right agency for this. Uh, and I do, I agree, but I'd love to sort of hear from the agency about how, how they would parse this out, like what? Which would be, age, which agency? The HCB. Would it be business as usual, which is exemplary, you know, or in this opportunity with these CARES funds, would they do something slightly different, and what would that look like? Well, um, they've testified that they would be helping organizations. It would be different. Okay. Um, they don't. VHCB does not individually does not fund individual projects to the nth degree, which is what they're talking, which is what they're talking about here, which is, which is having the funds to be dispersed to a, to a housing organization to, to purchase a, a, a facility that might be used for um, homeless or DV or where, wherever else the needs are. Um, so in, in the conventional way of doing business is planning grants and supp other supports. And this is, this is different, but if we need to hear from them again, then, um, then we can request them to come in. Certainly. Oh, I, I don't know if anyone else feels that. I, I'm just trying to get my arms around it. Yeah, and it's a lot to get your arms around. There's no question. Um, Representative Triano, then Hango. So I guess it seems clear to me that um, rental arrears, um, rental subsidies uh, is the focus of spending this money at this point challenging piece, I think, will be how can we direct money towards services that we heard about today that are essential in keeping people in their homes. And, you know, we heard Mary talk about uh, wraparound services to the tune of, you know, $125,000, $150,000 a year. Now, I've dealt with numerous people that are, were in those services, and, you know, this is someone with them 24 seven, you know, and you know, it's a very expensive thing, but it's, it's the only way by the time that those services are come to be it's the only way that we can keep those people in homes and safe. Um, so you know, that seems to be the challenge and trying to apply money that is so needed to these services um, and with the risk of it, not being able to uh, us, not being able to do it or, Applying it and having to pay it back is daunting for me. I just, you know, it, it really, um, the need is so great and the risk is so great. And it really makes me a little bit nervous um, about trying to deal with this um, piece that we all know is necessary. Yeah. Well, on one hand, I'd say good. You know, good. I'm glad it makes us all nervous because it's it's important stuff. It's not, you know, it's 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 important stuff. Um, I think the eye opening number from Mary the, was the reminder that it costs eight hundred thousand dollars a year to house someone in um, yeah. a psychiatric hospital. That's true. That is true. Um, and if you, oh, go I'm, the, I'm sorry. Was that eight hundred thousand? Yes. Yeah. I miss that. All right. Well, we look at look, we look at choices for care, you know, and the way that had impact has impacted um, nursing home populations with a program that is genuinely um, well used and and well received and well needed in our communities, uh, but you know it upset the balance of of, uh, of occupancy in our nursing homes. So yeah. you got, actually have to look at that 
aspect as well, I think. Well, and go back and look at the chart that was presented by Pathways for the um, the services, you know, compared to uh, psychiatric hospital or emergency room services, yeah. you know, and this was, you know, the numbers go back to the roadmap to end homelessness, but, yeah. you know, a pathway situation, the services cost, you know, f so much less. Sure. Well. I, I wouldn't even say what they are, but, you know, they just, but it just gives you the idea of those that can receive these services save so much money. Sure. From the from the, the you know what I would call the retail spending eight hundred thousand I mean we have to have people in that facility, um, but that's just a lot of money. Um, well, I mean we we recognize that the savings every every um, uh, uh, all the Vermonter that is served by um, uh, uh, choices for care saves approximately thirty thousand dollars a year in nursing home costs. Yeah. So, you know, the cost effectiveness, I think to me has always been the focus. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's sometimes you have to be uh, aware of, you know, what goes down the line, how, how that goes down the line and, yeah. and uh, it's things like that. But, uh, you know, I just, I just feel really strongly that, um, you know, we got to get some money for services because that is so important um, for us to uh, be able to, keep people in these homes. I mean, that's the key. Yep. Yep. And that's where we keep arguing. So um, yeah. Representative Hango. So I have a couple of questions and a couple of thoughts. Um, Chair Stevens, you said um, we need to find out what human services can do with their portion of the money. I really need to know that before I can make any any recommendations of what I think should happen. To Representative Clackey's point about regional um, funding, I really, I, I feel like AHS was going in that direction with OEO being um, the ones to disseminate the, the money in the future to regional local organizations, community partners who know best the population in their communities. So my suggestion is that we don't specifically allocate money to various regions, but let the people who know what the need is um, work that out at some point. Um, wraparound services that Representative Mariano is talking about, that really, in my mind, that the answer to that is gonna have to come from what human services is using their money on and can we work together collaboratively with them to come up with a solution for the services portion. Um, I see us really as housing in this committee, although I know that services and housing go hand in hand, um, but I see human services as being the primary driver of the services portion of housing. So for our our responsibilities in terms of housing, I'm seeing a few suggestions for the money, you know, just as I've taken notes on the various people who have come in and, and advocated to us, rental arrearages, rental subsidies, um, building new units, rehabbing old units, mobile homes and repurposing motels. I'm probably missing a bunch of things in there that have been suggested to us, but I really think that we need to focus the, the majority of our money on housing if we can get an assurance that human services is going to help us out with the, the wraparound services part. So those are just random thoughts, brainstorming, um, so I'm just throwing that out there. Yep, thank you. No, you, you knocked off quite a bunch of the lists of, of, of things that have been discussed. Um, emergency shelters, you know, re, re, you know, rehabbing some of the emergency shelters, um, you know, the Housing First services. I know we heard from um, every agency has a bit of a Housing First thing. It's not just pathways. Um, but again, it's finding out what human services can concentrate on. And again, we may have, to, we may just move forward with the capital side of it uh, because, and, and try to try to see where this 40, and, and again, the $42 million, we could, we could, we have the freedom right now to say that, well, that could be 28 million. 
that could be 52 million. That could be, you know, the, the enhanced VHIP program. We might decide that that should be a $12 million program instead of an eight or a $6 million program, or will it even work at all? Um, given the way it's structured, I think we, we're going to hear some stuff from David that, um, you know, some recent, or some recent verbiage from the treasury, you know, cast doubt on, on some of the precepts of the VHIP money um how, and how it can be used so uh no it, i <laughs> it's a yes to everything here you know it is going to be hard it is going to be where we need to keep getting as much information as we possibly can i will send an email to the chair of the human services committee and find out from if i can find out from her what they're considering for their uh portion of the um because they may be dealing with child care you know, they may be dealing with um, whatever, what their portfolio is, um, which does overlap a little bit with us. Um, Representative Zahn. Just uh, in terms of the witnesses or the you know, Representative Kalaki's request for witnesses, I, um, I assume and I could be wrong that there will be quite a bit of discussion. So if it's possible to have witnesses in on a more sort of consultancy basis, you know, rather than sort of giving us testimony and kind of uh, offering up a lot of commentary, if they could just sort of be present to be asked questions when needed. I don't know if people are available in that capacity or not, but I think that would be, at least for me, far more productive than sitting through like 15 or 20 minutes of testimony and then having questions. I think just getting right to questions that we need answered in order to make decisions would be helpful. I we tend to agree kind of like a session if we were in back in our committee room where people are just sitting around us and available to answer questions um yeah i again i will work on getting um i will work on getting a handful of folks who can who can get invited and i think it would be somebody from vhcb i think it would be somebody from legal aid it would be somebody from the administration if they're available um, and again, if you have, if you have other suggestions, um, I see Tony has suggested that she might be available. So, um, yes, Lisa. Yeah, I really think it would be helpful to have somebody, um, who is knowledgeable about the human services money, as well as the, the housing money from the administration that could talk to us if we have questions that could just answer our questions, not necessarily talk to us and provide testimony because we've heard a lot of that, but we haven't heard a whole lot recently from AHS. So I, you know, I'm maybe, maybe your conversation, your email with um, Chair Pugh will, will solve that problem for us. Um, but whatever we can do to have people on hand to answer questions would be great. I, I really like that idea. Thanks. Yep. yep. And remember we're, we're responding to, you know, we're using everything that we've heard as a jumping off point. And so, um, you know, we have, we have a lot of leeway to, and we have a lot of really good suggestions starting with, starting with the rental or rearage program and and the VHIP program and then moving into what we've heard from others so yeah having people on the sidelines would be great um and you know i think the services at least as it's defined for housing we are still in a holding pattern in turn because well we're not in a holding pattern. we're in a wishing wishful holding pattern in the sense that maybe i'll get an email tomorrow that says yes you can use it for for services after all and then we can plug it right in but um no, that's it's uh, we will we will try to get we will try to get folks here. Speaking of AHS, I uh, if you didn't hear, um, Commissioner Schatz is stepping down at the end of the month, um, and Sean Brown, the Deputy Commissioner who testified to us last week, is taking over for him. So wow. we at least have Commissioner Schatz through this process yeah. if he's available. Uh -huh. So um, he he's he's put in his time. Where's he heading? Do we know? I no, not anywhere sp specifically. I mean, the the phrase was retired. Yeah. So um, yeah. he's he's 
I mean, the paper, it's no secret if the paper published it, but he's 66 and he said, it's time. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I've known Ken since he was juvenile defender back in the early 80s. Yeah, he's had a long and, and yeah. incredible career in public service. So, yeah. um, all right, committee, thank you for staying over um, to discuss this and we will see you tomorrow. Um, We'll see you tomorrow on the floor, and then we'll see you tomorrow in committee. Thank you. And Ron, I'll stay on for a few minutes. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you all. Bye. See you all tomorrow.